A Slap of the Fingers by Steve Bosley Read by the author The corridor was dimly lit, as it usually was at this time of night. The overhead strip lighting hummed slightly on low power. An open door at the far end spilled light into the gloom. Seth's trainers squeaked as he scuffed them along the tiled floor. The book he had been reading, Captain Underpants, hung by his side. His blonde curly hair lay in small tight ringlets against his cheeks and forehead. He brushed the lock aside absently. To his left his dad walked silently. He had tried to take Seth's hand more than once, but each time Seth had shaken him off. One of the nurses at the desk looked up as he walked past. What you reading, champ? He stepped from behind his desk and crouched down as Seth approached. Without breaking stride or turning his head, Seth tossed the book towards the nurse and kept walking. I'm sorry, it... It's okay, Mr. Rogers, I understand. The nurse picked the book off the floor and handed it back to the boy's dad. Taking the book and nodding at the nurse, Vernon Rogers turned back to his son. Seth, there was no need for that. He felt no conviction in what he said, however, and simply placed the book on a nearby shelf before continuing along the corridor. Seth's progress towards the door had become progressively slower until he had virtually ground to a halt. His arms were crossed and he shuffled forward slowly. His dad crouched down in front of him and took his hands. This time Seth made no effort to shake free. Come on mate, his dad said softly. We've got to do this. You've got to do this. Standing again, he held out a hand. Seth looked at it for a moment before taking it with his left hand. He dragged the back of his free hand across his face, wiping away the streak of snot that had reached his upper lip. Together they walked towards the open door and the light within. There was very little noise in this part of the hospital, which bothered Seth. He couldn't see how so many people could be crammed into one building and make almost no sound. Once, in school, he had been kept behind for cheating on a test. Mr Baxter had caught him looking at Heather Forrest's history answers and had asked him to remain after school. He had sat in silence in the classroom while Mr Baxter marked the other test papers. He had asked Seth to sit quietly and think about what he had actually been doing. Not cheating. Never cheating. Heather Forrest had started to develop breasts and Seth thought they were worth looking at. The silence offered him the opportunity to relive his adolescent fantasies, the reality of which was still several years away. The classroom, indeed the school, had been silent that evening, but all the children had gone home and he had been left alone with a teacher that thought he was a cheat. This was not the same at all. As the pair approached the open door, a man stepped out into the corridor. Mr Rogers, if you please. He opened both of his arms, shepherding them away from the door. He leaned down and spoke to Seth. Can I have a word with your dad for a minute, please? Seth stared at him and said nothing. He hadn't cried yet. He knew it was there waiting, but crying was what girls did, and Seth Rogers was no girl. He allowed himself to be moved away as the doctor stepped in front of him and began speaking to his dad. Seth couldn't hear what was being said, but he watched his dad's face and got all the information he needed. At first his dad smiled, a weak smile that didn't touch his eyes. Then his mouth slowly came open and he raised a hand to cover it. The other followed seconds later. He stood that way for another minute or so while the doctor continued to speak with him. Seth continued to watch his dad's face. 
Tears had started to well up in his eyes, and they shimmered in the dim light. Just for a second, his dad's eyes flicked to Seth. As their gaze met, the tears spilled out and ran down his cheeks. He made no sound. Instead, Seth watched his knuckles turn white as he pressed his hands harder against his mouth. The doctor spoke for another minute or so before turning to Seth. He smiled and ruffled the boy's hair. Seth watched him passively as he moved away, back down the corridor. Seth felt his dad's hands on his shoulders, but he continued to watch the doctor as he stopped to talk to one of the nurses at the station, the one that Seth had seen earlier. The hands moved to his face and gently turned it until it was pointing at his dad. Mr Rogers' eyes were swollen, puffy and red. The tears had gone, but it was clear that they had been there. This was his dad. His dad! If boys didn't cry, the dad certainly didn't. Seth sniffed as his dad squatted down, bringing him to Seth's eye level. Right. We're going to go in now. His hands had moved back to the shoulders and were stroking Seth's arms. Don't be frightened by the equipment. I'll be there with you. He paused for a moment and took a deep breath before continuing. We'll be good, buddy. His voice cracked slightly and the tears began to roll down his cheeks again, more freely now. He wiped a sleeve over his face before standing up. He looked down at his son and offered his hand again. Seth did not offer his hand in return, but allowed his dad to gently take it in his own. Together they both walked into the room. The light was bright in here, much brighter than the corridor, and Seth squinted momentarily while his eyes adjusted. He allowed his dad to lead him over to the bed. Seth closed his eyes completely. He didn't want to see. He could hear the ping of a machine somewhere to his right. The smell of antiseptic was strong and tickled the back of Seth's throat. He covered his mouth as he coughed. Open your eyes, mate, his dad said, placing a hand on his shoulder. Seth opened his eyes. His mum lay in front of him. She looked far more than her forty years. Her eyes were half open, her cheekbones protruded and her skin held a greyish tinge. Wires came from somewhere in her chest and connected to the monitor that was pinging. Her chest rose and fell slowly, matched by the rasping breaths that she took. Seth looked away. He didn't want to remember his mum like this. Her hair was gone. She'd always had such beautiful hair. Seth remembered the times he would spend running a brush through it as they watched TV. Sometimes he would plait it. In fact, he had become quite the expert creating ladders, spirals and crowns in her dark, auburn hair. But that had stopped when she fell ill. Over time, the hair had fallen out, leaving her with an almost bald head, save from one or two wispy strands at the front. No more plaits. No more anything. She reached a hand out towards her son. The fingers were those of a much older lady. Not his mum. When she spoke, her voice was quiet, almost inaudible. Seth, hold my hand. Seth continued to look away. Please, Seth. She started to cry. Her stick-thin arm lowered to the bed and she stretched out her fingers towards him. Seth. His dad's voice was gentle yet firm. Seth spun on his heels and ran out of the room, slamming the door as he went. It was a few moments before he heard the door open and his dad's voice calling to him, but by then he had turned a corner and was still running. He continued running until he had turned down several more corridors. As he approached the door, 
Seth slowed and opened it. Stepping inside, he closed the door. The room was dark, but Seth could make out cupboards and chairs, and he sagged to the floor in the far corner. He hugged his knees to his chest and began to cry. When he had cried for several minutes, he raised his head and wiped his eyes. He could hear his dad calling his name somewhere outside, but he had no desire to go back and see his mum. Not yet. As he sat in silence, Seth heard the door handle begin to turn. He pressed himself further into the shadows and hugged his knees tighter. There was a glimpse of light from the corridor as the door opened and then closed. Someone had stepped inside, but Seth could not see who it was. Seth, is it? a voice said. Seth remained silent as he heard the squeaking of shoes on the floor. The light came on as the figure flicked the switch. When his eyes had become accustomed to the light, Seth peered over his arms at the figure standing three or four paces in front of him. It was the nurse that had spoken to him earlier. I'm sorry I threw the book at you, Seth said. The nurse moved across the room and sat down on the floor alongside Seth. Think nothing of it, he waved his hand. My name's Kane, but my friends call me Red. He pointed to his head, indicating the shock of ginger hair that was there. We can be friends, so you can call me Red. He held out a hand to shake Seth's, but it was ignored and he took it back. Are you going to tell my dad where I am? Because I don't want to go back yet. No, Seth, I'm not. Seth relaxed a little and let his legs sink to the floor. Did the doctor tell you how long your mum had left? No. He looked down at his lap. It's not long, though. Did you see her? She looks bad. He began to cry again. Red shifted closer to Seth until their shoulders were touching. He smelled faintly of antiseptic, like Seth had smelled in his mum's room. It reminded him of the toilets at school. After they'd been cleaned, of course. Red looked around before he spoke. He leaned over and put his lips close to Seth's ear. Can I tell you a secret? He spoke in a whisper. Seth felt the breath on his cheek and could smell his breath. Whatever he had eaten for dinner couldn't have been very nice. A mint wouldn't go amiss, thought Seth. Seth nodded. Your mum has two days at most. Maybe three. You don't know that? Seth slid along the wall away from Red. You're not a doctor. No, I'm not. It's not that right, partner. Seth got to his feet. His parents had told him not to talk to strangers. This was a hospital, and this man had a uniform on, but he was definitely strange. He decided it was time to find his dad, and he moved towards the door. I can help your mum, Seth. Red remained seated. Seth stopped and turned around. If you want, that is. What can you do? You said you weren't a doctor. Nope, not a doctor. He paused briefly before standing up. But I can help your mum. How? Red held out both hands and smiled. Cure her. Simple as that. He placed both hands behind his back. Well, why can't the others do it? Can't you tell them what to do? Seth may have been only ten, but he was a bright ten. This didn't ring true. He began to back away towards the door. I can do things they can't. That's it. He flashed his smile again. Okay, well, do it then. Call my mum. Well, about that. He took a step towards Seth and bent forward until their eyes were level. I need you to do something for me in return. Like what? 
I want you to listen to what I'm asking, Seth. I want you to be clear what you need to do for me. This isn't something I ask of everyone, and it isn't something that you have to do. What if I don't want to do it? It's a good question. Red stood and took a step back from Seth and spread his arms again, smiling. Nothing. That's what happens. Nothing at all. You continue living your life. Your mum continues living hers. The smile vanished as quickly as it had come. Well, the two days she has left anyway. I don't believe you. His tears had dried up and now his fear was being replaced by anger. How will you cure her? With a snap of the fingers. To illustrate his point, he clicked his fingers in front of Seth's face. How will that help? Well, let me show you. With a snap of your fingers. He closed the distance to Seth in an instant, grabbed his right wrist and yanked him closer. Before he had a chance to protest, Red took all four fingers on Seth's hand in his palm and squeezed. As the first bone broke, Seth screamed and Red shoved the fingers backwards towards his wrist. His screams covered the snapping but Seth felt each of his fingers break and he pulled away. He stumbled to the floor holding the wrist of his broken hand. Each of the fingers pointed at an unlikely angle. The pain was the worst that he had ever experienced, and as he hit the floor, he threw up. He tried to stand and run for the door, but Red stepped in the way. Hold on now, Red said, still smiling. He grabbed the hand again, fighting against Seth's scratching and kicking. Placing the mangled hand between his palms, he rubbed them together swiftly, then let go and stepped back. Seth felt a moment of heat in his hand. It felt like the time he had put his hand on the hot plate in the oven to see what would happen. He had been a lot younger and the burns had blistered, even though he had pulled his hand away quickly. He snatched his arm away and returned to the corner of the room, clutching the hand. The hand, which was no longer hurting. When he looked down at it, the fingers were all present and correct, standing exactly as they should. No perpendicular bends, no breaks, no pain. He flexed the fingers once, then looked up at Red. They don't hurt anymore. He resumed flexing the fingers without taking his eyes off Red, who just smiled. What did you do? They were broken, and I made them better. I don't think my mum has any broken bones. Doesn't matter. It works for more than just broken bones. Seth looked down at his hand and rubbed it while he tried to comprehend what had just happened. Red stood across the room and looked at him, impassive. Can you really cure her? Make it go away? The, the cancer, I mean. Yeah. But you need to do something for me first. What? It's got to be our secret. Red made a gesture of zipping his mouth closed. I won't help your mum if you tell anyone. Seth had learned about men like this at school. Pedophiles. He began to edge towards the door. Red noticed the look on the boy's face and held up his hands. No, no, it's not like that. I simply require you. He paused before leaning forward. His smile had disappeared. To kill two people for me, he finished. Seth stopped where he was, his mouth falling open. I, I couldn't kill anyone. I'm ten. No problem. I'm not going to force you. You should probably go and see your mum before it's too late. Red turned his back and walked to the window. Seth went to the door and reached the handle, but stopped before turning it and looked back at Red. Who would I need to kill? Red turned slowly, hands steepled in front of his chest. His smile was back in place. Well, that's up to you. He held up his index finger. One must be someone you don't know. 
He paused slightly, allowing Seth to race to the conclusion. The second must be someone you know. Someone you know well. I don't think I can do that. Tears were rolling down Seth's cheeks. Look, I'll make it easy for you. You choose the first and I'll choose the second. Seth rubbed his hand again as he considered the offer. He had never had a fight at school. Had never really even shouted at someone he knew. Killing someone? But it was his mum. The question was, could he do it for his mum? Can I ask my dad? Red shook his head. But I will give you some time to think about it. But don't take too long. The clock's ticking. He tapped a finger on his wrist to where his watch would have been had he been wearing one. Okay. Seth opened the door and walked out of the room, leaving the door open. In the corridor he could hear his dad still shouting for him. Seth followed the sound and headed back towards his mum's room. As he turned a corner he saw his dad who came running towards him. He scooped him up in a hog. Where did you go? Your mum's upset. It would help her loads if you went back into her. Seth allowed himself to be led back to his mum's room. This time he walked in, eyes open. His mum was exactly as he remembered, gaunt, pale and tired. Her half-lidded eyes opened when she saw him and she made an effort to reach for him. Only her right arm twitched, the left lay flaccid on the bed. Seth looked at the offered hand for a moment. It was thin. Thin like those anorexic girls he had learned about at school. Gently he took the offered hand, tears spilling down his cheeks as he did. Closing his eyes, he tried to imagine his mum as she had been, not as she was now. It was hard, but when she spoke, it flooded back to him. Seth, baby, said his mum, I'm sorry I'm not going to see you grow up to be a man. She coughed weakly before continuing. To see you get married, have kids. Seth moved towards his mum and put his head on her chest, throwing his arms around her. She stroked his hair and face, wiping away the tears. Seth, I need you to look after your dad for me. Make sure he eats his vegetables and doesn't go to bed too late. Seth knew his mum wasn't talking about his dad, but he muttered that he would. Go and wait outside, would you? I want to talk to your dad. As he lifted his head from her chest, he looked at her. She smiled and blew him a kiss. It's okay, Seth. That'll be out in a minute. He walked to the door slowly, keeping his eyes on his mum, until his dad gently directed him out of the room and closed the door. He heard his dad start to cry as he turned away. Halfway down the corridor, leaning against the wall, was Red. He gave Seth an apologetic wave. Seth put an ear to the door and could still hear his dad talking through the sobs. Stepping away, he walked down the corridor and stopped in front of Red. He gave a quick look up and down the corridor to ensure they were alone. Then he wiped his eyes and looked up at the man in front of him. What do I have to do then? His face was set and left little doubt about what he was saying, but Red asked anyway. You want to save your mum then? Seth nodded. Okay, here's how it works. He dropped his head until his eyes were level with Seth's. You pick the first. Could be anyone. He opened his arms wide again. Anyone. Choice is yours. Someone with no family? Someone that won't be missed? A vagrant? A homeless person? A tramp? A beggar? Like it? Red smiled broadly for a moment before continuing. Then go and do it. The night had been difficult. Sleep was slow to come and when it did it was fitful, tortured. His mum screamed for him to help her. 
Red stood behind her, an expression on his face that said, You can change all of this. He had risen early, dressed and left the house before his dad had stirred. He had never left the house on his own before, at least not without his mum or dad knowing where he was going. He could hardly ask permission now. Dad, I'm just off to go and kill someone. I'll be back for dinner. The walk to the canal took about fifteen minutes. It was somewhere he had often come with his friends. Skimming stones and scaring ducks were the things you did at ten years old. Today he was looking for something else. The boys all knew him as Rodney. He was a middle-aged man that lived in a hole in the river bank. Two large sheets of cardboard covered the hole most days, but the boys knew he was in there. It was the overpowering stench of extra strong cider and human waste that gave it away. Stepping carefully over the empty cans that littered the path alongside the canal, Seth carefully climbed down until he stood in front of the cardboard covered hole. Easing back one of the sheets, Seth peered inside. The early morning light crept inside, highlighting Rodney's head. The stained woollen cap he wore poked out of what could only be described as a sleeping bag. It looked like two large stained coats had been sewn together with a shoelace, but underneath it Rodney snored loudly. Seth pulled out the kitchen knife that he had taken from home. The blade was almost as long as his forearm and it shone in the early morning sun. He stared at the sleeping figure for a time. Rodney was strange, sometimes a little creepy, but he had never really caused any trouble. Sometimes he would shout at the boys when they scared the ducks on the water. Sometimes he would ask them for money, but mostly he kept to himself. After a minute or so, Seth lowered the knife. Who was he kidding? He couldn't kill someone. Did that mean he didn't love his mum as much as a strange man that no one cared about? He didn't know the answer to that, but it didn't change the fact that he couldn't do it. Putting the knife back inside his coat, Seth pulled his head out of the shadows and pulled the sheet of cardboard back into place, shutting Rodney back into his hole. On his hands and knees, Seth began to clamber back up the short grassy slope. With the early morning dew making the surface slick, progress was slow, but a few minutes later his hand reached the gravel path. That was when he heard someone clear his throat, and looking up he saw Red standing over him, one arm reaching down towards him. Would you like a hand up, buddy? I'll take you back home, so you and your dad can visit your mum. He took hold of Seth's hand and pulled him onto the path. It's her last day today, I'm led to believe. I'm afraid, Seth said, looking up at Red. I know. Let me help you. Red slid down the small slope and beckoned Seth to follow. Together they walked back to the cardboard covered opening in the bank. Red lifted away one of the large cardboard sheets and held out a hand to Seth. Knife, please. Without speaking, Seth pulled out the knife and handed it to Red. It felt like a dream. Seth's arm didn't feel connected to his body. He watched as his hand released the knife. Red took it from him and ducked inside Rodney's meagre shelter. Rodney lay motionless, still snoring loudly, as Red placed the point of the knife over the man's chest. He turned back to Seth. Come on, just here. Push it in just here. Seth slipped inside next to Red and took the knife handle from him. He looked briefly at Red, who nodded. Closing his eyes and gritting his teeth, Seth leaned on the knife and it slipped between Rodney's ribs into his heart. Rodney's eyes flew open and his mouth opened to scream. Red placed a hand over the open mouth and pushed his head back to the ground. Rodney continued to make muffled attempts to scream for several seconds before his body relaxed and his eyes closed. 
Red had to prise Seth's hands off the knife handle that he still gripped tightly. Seth moved away from the lifeless body and backed out of the hole, knocking the remaining piece of cardboard over. He watched Red as he pulled the knife out of the body and wiped it against the makeshift sleeping bag. To Seth, Red appeared to be moving in slow motion. He could hear his heart thumping, feel his chest rising and falling as he struggled to catch his breath. He watched, mouth agape, as Red leant over Rodney's body and placed a hand against his neck. After a moment, he turned to Seth and gave him the thumbs up. He backed his way out of the hole, dragging Rodney's body, still in his sleeping bag, positioning it alongside the canal. He turned to Seth, smiling. Nicely done, young sir, he said, and kicked the body into the water, dropping the knife in with it. Seth watched the body as it floated away from them, before disappearing under the water, out of sight below the surface. Will my mum be better now? Seth asked. Go home, Seth. Red climbed back up the bank, onto the path, and walked away. When Seth got home, his dad was already awake. He gave Seth a look that said, Where have you been? But said nothing. Instead, he picked him up in a big hug. I've just had a call from the hospital. Your mum is showing improvements. We're going to go and see her now. The two left the house, jumped in the car and drove to the hospital. When they walked onto the ward, a doctor, the same one that had spoken with them the previous day, met them. His demeanour was different and he greeted them both with a smile. Mr Rogers, I don't want to get your hopes up, and I can't explain why, but when I checked on your wife first thing this morning, her stats had improved, her heart rate is steady. Her blood work is closer to normal than it has been in months. She looks, well, better. Can we see her? Mr Rogers placed an arm around his son's shoulders and pulled him close. Yes, yeah, of course. The doctor led them along the corridor and into the room where Seth's mum lay. On seeing her, Seth broke into a big smile. He rushed to the bed, jumped on it, and hugged his mum. Her skin had tightened. It was a pleasant pinkish colour and she hugged him with both arms. Seth's dad followed and together they held each other crying. Doctor, what does this mean? How is this possible? Mr Rogers, if I told you I knew, I'd be lying. We still have tests to run and scans to take so we still don't know exactly what's happening inside your wife. The family stopped hugging and turned to the doctor. But it is a very promising sign. At that, the three resumed hugging, and the doctor left them. An hour or so passed before the doctor returned, explaining that Mrs Rogers needed rest. She was also needed to make a start on the battery of tests that were required. So Seth and his dad left her and walked back to the car. As they were leaving the building, Seth caught sight of Red leaning against the nurse's station. He looked at Seth and nodded. Seth excused himself from his dad, saying he needed the toilet, and came back in to Red, who steered him away from the nurse's station a little way along the corridor. How's your mum? She's great. She's doing really well. The doctors are running some tests, but they think it's looking good for her. All right. Red held up a hand and Seth slapped his palm. It echoed in the quiet of the corridor and one of the nurses looked up at them. Red bent down, lowering his voice to a whisper. My turn now. For what? Seth asked. My turn to pick. It would be a shame to see your mum doing so well one day, only to slip away the next, don't you think? 
but she's well now. Why do I need to do anything else? A deal is a deal, and you, sir, made a deal. I don't think I can do it again. Fine, as long as you're clear on the consequences. Seth thought he was clear, but asked anyway. Will my mum die? Well, tomorrow morning, when the consultant pays his first visit, he will find that your mum has slipped into unconsciousness. Further investigation will confirm that the cancer is back. Two days later, her life support will be switched off. By your dad. Please don't do that. His voice was small and pitiful. Please. One of the other nurses came over to the pair and asked Seth if everything was alright. Red gave him a look that left no doubt as to the correct answer. Yes, thank you, said Seth. The nurse walked back up the corridor. Red smiled at the nurse as she walked away, but when she had gone he turned back to Seth and raised his eyebrows. Well? After a moment of consideration, Seth sighed deeply, shoulders slumping. <sighs> Who do I need to kill? Ha! <laughs> Nicely done, young sir. Red flashed his brilliant white smile again. It never ceases to amaze me how quickly children adapt to their circumstances. Seth stood silently. I'll take care of the hard work. You just need to complete the task. Has it got to be someone I know? Afraid so? That's just the way it is. I don't make the rules. Oh, wait. Yes, I do. He laughed at this, but Seth saw nothing funny. He was beginning to feel sick and wanted to get as far away from this man as possible. Look, I'll come to your house tomorrow and we'll do it there. He shrugged. Problem solved. What if my dad sees us? I'll take care of your dad. Don't worry. He shrugged again. You're not going to hurt my dad, are you? No, Seth. What do you take me for? Standing up, he said, Now, run along, little man. I'll see you tomorrow. He shot Seth with a pistol finger before walking back along the corridor. Seth turned and ran out of the hospital and found his dad. Together they returned home. Sleep was difficult to come by for Seth that night. He and his dad had spent the evening talking about the miraculous turn of events with his mum. More precisely, Seth had listened to his dad talk about his wife. Seth himself was thinking about what it was that he needed to do the next day. He must have drifted off to sleep at some point during the night because when he opened his eyes, sun streamed through a gap in the curtains in his bedroom. He didn't feel rested. His arms and legs were heavy as he walked downstairs. The house was quiet and when he walked into the kitchen, there was no evidence that his dad had been down for breakfast. He shouted for his dad and when he received no reply, Seth went back upstairs and into his mum and dad's room. The curtains were closed, but the bed looked like it hadn't been slept in. A knock at the back door took Seth back downstairs into the kitchen. He could see a shape outside through the frosted glass. The shape knocked again and Seth moved slowly towards the door. Come out, come out, wherever you are! The voice outside was that of Red. He knocked again. I know you're in there. Seth moved to the back door and turned the key. As he did, the door swung inwards, revealing Red, hands on hips. At his feet lay a body, face down, a brown cloth sack over its head and hands tied behind its back. It was motionless. Red grabbed the body at the shoulders and began to drag it into the kitchen. Little help, champ? Red glanced at Seth who backed away into the kitchen. Well, thank you, kind sir. 
When Red had dragged the body into the kitchen, he stepped over it and closed the door. Don't want those nosy neighbours looking in now, do we? The thought that anyone looking would surely have seen Red standing at the back door did not occur to Seth, who now stood against the opposite wall, eyes wide, fists clenched. I can't do it, I can't do it, Seth repeated, shaking his head. He spoke quietly in a voice he hadn't used since his first days at primary school, when he had been asked by a year six student to steal Mr. Radley's apple that he kept in his desk drawer. He had bowed to the pressure then and taken the apple. The older boy had feigned ignorance when Mr. Radley had come out of the little cupboard at the back of the classroom and stood open-mouthed as he pointed a finger at Seth, who was holding the apple. That had been his first taste of detention, a missed break time, sat inside while his friends played in the playground. He didn't like it then, and he suspected the consequences of what was being asked of him now would be far worse than being kept inside for fifteen minutes. His head shaking was becoming more vigorous, and he continued to chant his mantra, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it, I'm not doing it. Red walked over and placed a hand on his shoulder, then squatted down alongside Seth. I understand, I understand. He bowed his head as he spoke, like a priest administering the last rites to one of his flock. Would it help if I said I'd dispose of the body? He smiled and nudged Seth. Would it? Would you like that? No one will ever know. Trust me. He stood up spreading his arms and smiling. To Seth he looked like the used car salesman they had bought their 2010 Honda Jazz from. The car spent more time back with Honda than it has on the road, his dad had said. He'd never really seen his dad angry until he saw him in that car. But Seth, he said, crouching back down and brushing Seth's chin with his fist. You'll have your mum. How do I know you'll keep your word? He had stopped shaking his head, but tears were rolling down his cheeks. Well, you don't. That's a risk you'll have to take. Red laughed again. Believe it or not, this is not the first time I've done this, and I've yet to have an unsatisfied customer. It just depends on how much you love your mum. I love my mum a lot. Seth didn't doubt that this was not Red's first time. He did, however, doubt that everyone was a satisfied customer. His ten-year-old mind was running faster than it had in his short life. He did believe that Red could get rid of the body without anyone finding it. He had got it here undetected after all. He also believed that it was within Red's power to cure his mum of the cancer that had been eating her slowly for the last six months. He'd broken and healed Seth's fingers with a touch of his hand, and hadn't his mum been right up against death's door before going into a remission that astounded the medical people at the hospital? Believing all that, there were two questions as Seth saw it. Firstly, did he, Seth, trust Red to keep his word? There was no doubt in his mind that Red could do what he said, but would he do what he said? Secondly, and to Seth more importantly, could he live with the knowledge that he had killed two people? Would he be able to sit at breakfast with his mum and dad and look across the table as his mum buttered his toast without reliving the horrors of what he had done? He had already decided that this was something that he would bear on his own. His dad might be eternally grateful to have his wife back, but would he be able to forgive his son? Clock's ticking! said Red, wagging his finger left and right like a metronome ticking the seconds away. Seth could feel his own life melting away with every tick of Red's metronomic finger. He was in a no-win situation. He would either lose his mum or have to live with the knowledge that he had taken two lives. That was what it boiled down to. Stepping away from the wall, he made his decision. I'll do it. 
There was no emotion as he spoke. Red produced a large knife from somewhere. He held it out to the shaking boy. Good choice. He moved closer to the body, still motionless, and knelt alongside it. He untied the cord that held the hands in place and beckoned Seth closer. As Seth moved within a pace of the body, Red flipped it onto its back. The cloth sack moved slowly in and out with every breath the body took. It was a man, that much he could tell. Average height, average build. He wore nondescript brown corduroy trousers. Old man trousers, his dad called them. Light blue ankle socks showed above the red carpet slippers. Taken before breakfast, Seth thought. I wonder what he was going to have. The t-shirt was burgundy with gold hoops around the middle. The stomach was moving up and down rhythmically. He seemed to be sleeping peacefully. Batter up, said Red, leaning forward and loosening the cord, fastening the cloth around the man's neck. Can't have him leaving this earth with a bag on his head, can we? He took a hold of the top of the sack and slid it over his face. Seth staggered back and sat down hard on the floor, the knife clattering to the ground beside him. He was looking at his father. Seth sat that way for a moment, before scurrying on his hands and knees over to his dad. He threw himself on the motionless body, clutching it tightly. Dad! Dad! He called to the unconscious form between sobs. Tick tock, Red said, standing over the pair. Pick someone else! Anyone else! Seth continued to cling to his dad. Doesn't work that way. Red laughed and hopped up and down in what Seth considered was an approximation of Irish dancing. After a few steps he stopped dancing but the smile remained. Where would the fun be in that? He clapped his hands together briskly and gave one last bounce. This way's much more entertaining, he shrugged, don't you think? It's not fair, I, I can't choose. Seth sat up and looked at the ebullient red. I won't choose. He crossed his arms in front of his chest and nodded. Red began tilting his head from left to right and started to sing. Poor little Seth, he gave me his oath. He won't play my game, so I'll have to take both. He picked the knife off the floor and knelt over Seth's dad, placing the knife over his heart. No! Seth lunged forward and grabbed Red's arm, pulling it away. Please, no! He dragged the word out and looked into Red's face. Red was still smiling, but it didn't touch his eyes. They looked back at Seth, a fire burning deep inside the pupils. He blinked, and the flame that Seth had seen was gone. Make your choice, boy! The laughing, prancing, singing man was gone. In his place was Red, the devil. At that moment, Seth knew this to be true, as true as his own blonde hair, as true as the freckles on his face. And in that instant, he knew someone would have to die. If it wasn't his dad or his mum, it would be him. <sighs> let, let me think. Seth clasped both hands together in front of his chin. His tears continued to fall as he spoke. He screwed his eyes shut and clutched his head with both hands. Think fast, little man. Your prey is stirring. The court jester was back, clapping his hands again. Seth looked at his dad. His eyelids had begun to flutter, and he was flexing his fingers. It's much easier to do when he's not moving. Hurry, hurry! Seth shuffled across the floor and picked up the discarded knife before moving back to his dad's side. He looked into his dad's face for a moment and then planted a kiss on his cheek. I'm so sorry, Dad, he said, wiping his eyes. He grasped the handle of the knife in both hands and raised the blade over his head. As he did, his dad's eyes fluttered open. He saw his son kneeling over him and the knife raised above his head. He brought his arms up to his face so Seth couldn't see his eyes. Seth slowly lowered the arm holding the knife and let it fall to the floor. 
he began to cry again, long, racking sobs that shook his whole body. His dad sat up and wrapped his arms around his son. Seth sank into the embrace, still shaking. His dad smelt good. It was a smell he associated with his earliest memories. Happy memories of times when, as a younger boy, his dad would sit him in his lap and read to him. They had read the Harry Potter series together. It had taken a long time, many weeks, even months passed, sitting with his dad in the evening. Seth hadn't been able to read then, but he had been enthralled by the story, and the time spent with his dad was the best. His dad used a particular brand of aftershave or soap. Seth didn't know which, but he thought it smelled wonderful. Vaguely apple-scented, the smell now transported him back in time. In his dad's embrace, he continued crying, but he could now feel his dad crying too. The two held each other until Red spoke. Very, very nice. Touching. He was clapping again, this time slowly. He pulled a white handkerchief out of the breast pocket of his jacket and used it to wipe away imaginary tears. Folding the handkerchief up and replacing it, he folded his arms in front of his chest and looked at the boy and his dad on the floor, still tightly holding each other. Red stuck out his bottom lip, making him look like a sulky teenager who's been told he can't go to the cinema with his friends until his chores are done. I don't want sadness and love. He stamped his foot to punctuate the point. I want the sadness and misery. Red waited for a response. When none was forthcoming, he continued. I believe one of you still owes me something, and it's not nice to keep a person waiting. He wagged a finger at the pair in front of him. Seth pulled himself away from his dad and turned to face Red. He knew, somehow he had known from the beginning, that it would end like this. He reached across to where he had left the knife and grasped it. He still wasn't sure what he was going to do with it. He didn't think he could drive the knife into his dad before, when he lay still, unconscious on the floor. He was convinced that he couldn't do it now, with his dad looking at him. Would he put up a fight with his son? Or would he offer himself to save his wife, Seth's mum? Neither seemed like a good outcome to Seth. He swivelled round until he faced his dad, knife in hand, when his dad spoke. I can't do it, you bastard! Seth frowned. He had never heard his dad swear like that before. Sure, he had heard it at school, but his dad had told him to put words like that on the list of things never to say in front of your parents. And so he had. Perhaps it didn't work both ways, Seth mused. His dad was still talking and had stood up. He's my son, for Christ's sake. Did you really think I'd kill him? Seth sat looking up at his dad, eye to eye with red. It took several moments for realisation to dawn before Seth spoke. Dad, what do you mean? He let the knife clatter back to the floor once more. His dad looked down at him. Tears were streaming down his cheeks. He said he could save your mum, and I believed him. How? asked Seth. Did he hurt you too? Why? Did he hurt you? Seth's dad turned back to Red. Did you hurt my boy? If you did, I'll... Your what? Red stepped closer to Seth's dad. Your what, big man? Hurt me too? Red laughed and stuck his chin out towards Seth's dad. Go for it, champ. Give it your best shot. Swing away. As if to emphasise his point, he placed his index finger on the tip of his chin. He stood that way for several seconds before stepping back and laughing. Thought not. Try him. He pointed at Seth on the floor, still looking up at the two men. He's more your size. I can't imagine he'll put up too much of a fight. You think I'll hurt my son? Well, no, I really didn't. But I did think it would be fun to watch the two of you go at it. 
He clapped his hands together briskly before turning and walking over to the kitchen table. He slid out one of the chairs and sat down. He crossed his legs and placed both hands on his knee. Seth noticed his socks. They were white and reached up his legs beyond the hem of the trousers. They didn't go with the suit. Seth thought this was odd, even humorous, and he smiled, not sure why he'd noticed this. Go to it then. Red clapped sharply twice and returned his hands to his knee. Seth turned to face his dad. Both were crying. It was Seth's dad that managed to speak first. I can't do it, Seth. He dragged his hand across his face. Your mum wouldn't want it. He held his arms open and Seth slid across the floor and was wrapped in a hug. The pair stayed that way for another minute before Seth's dad spoke again. You should do it. Seth pushed himself away from his dad and looked at him. Do what? He was still crying. Kill me, Seth. You and your mum will be okay. I'll help you. He picked up the discarded knife and brought it to his throat. No, 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 no. Red stood up and the chair clattered to the floor. That's not allowed. Killing yourself is not in the rules of the agreement. It has to be you to him or him to you. He pointed alternately at Seth and his dad before turning and standing his chair back up. With one final look at the pair, he sat back down. I'm sorry, Seth. His dad lifted Seth's arm and, prizing apart the bald fist, he placed the knife in his son's hand. Just here. He lifted his chin and placed his finger on the side of his throat. Hard and fast. I want you to close your eyes, think of your mum, then do it. Tears had started to run down his cheeks again. Then I want you to run. Don't look back. Just run. As if in a daze, Seth watched first as his dad handed him the knife, then placed the point against his own neck. He could see a trickle of blood where the knife rested. His dad's hands fell away, leaving Seth in control of the now trembling knife. He continued to stare at the thin trickle of blood that ran down his dad's exposed neck. As it disappeared inside the t-shirt, Seth dropped the knife and threw his arms around his dad's neck. I don't want to, Dad. Please don't make me. His body hitched as he sobbed. The pair stayed that way for several minutes before Seth's dad stood up, still clutching his son. Think you have your answer, he said. I just want to be with my wife for the last few hours. Red stood up and began to clap his hands slowly. Very good, boys, very good. He walked around the table and placed one hand on each of the other two. I can see that was a hard decision for you. Seth's dad pushed the oily hand off his shoulder. An impossible decision. Did you really think we'd do it? Well, not really, but it was certainly fun watching you struggle with it. He moved back to his chair and sat down. But boys, he let the final word hang in the air for a moment. Did you really think I'd let your beautiful wife, your beautiful mum, he nodded at Seth, die? After all you've been through? He held out his hands. Come on now, you've both killed someone. That's got to be worth something, right? Am I right? Father and son remained silent, hugging each other. I think you've been good little boys and you deserve a break. Why not toddle off to the hospital and see the surprise I've left there for you? He folded his arms and sat back in the chair, looking satisfied with himself. Is my mum okay? Have you helped her? Well, let's just say that medical science is amazing. Come on, Dad, we need to go. Seth moved towards the back door, pulling his dad's arm. Reluctantly, his dad followed, still looking back at the smiling red sat behind his kitchen table. The journey to the hospital seemed to take an eternity to Seth. The reality was that it took barely 20 minutes. 
Seth fidgeted in his seat the whole way, urging his dad to drive faster, but getting pulled over would simply increase the weight to see his mum, so his dad had stuck to the speed limit. Upon arrival, they both ran into the hospital, along the corridors, until they reached the ward where Seth's mum was. They had slowed to a brisk walk, but they swept past the nurse's station, ignoring the nurse, who stood up and tried to call after them. At the end of the corridor, they could see a doctor, bent over a clipboard, making notes. He looked up as Seth and his dad approached and tried to step in front of them, but was brushed aside and the pair entered the room. The bed was empty. Seth and his dad stood in the empty room, staring at the bed. The doctor came back into the room and placed a hand on Seth's dad's shoulder. Mr Rogers, I'm so sorry. Seth's dad cut him off. Where's my wife? His breathing was coming in ragged gulps. Mr Rogers, your wife passed away earlier this morning. We've been trying to contact you. I'm so very sorry. No, that can't be true. We were promised. He clutched his son closely to him. I'm afraid your wife was a very sick lady. We could not have, would not have made any promises for her recovery. I thought you understood her prognosis. If you would like to speak to a counsellor or one of our priests, I can arrange that for you. He spoke quietly, gently. I don't need a priest, I need my wife! As he spoke, Seth's dad looked over the doctor's shoulder and saw Red walk past the door. He paused briefly, looked at Seth and his dad and shrugged his shoulders before walking off. There, him! He's the one! Ask him! Both Seth and his dad pushed past the doctor and ran out of the room. They looked up and down the corridor, but there was no sign of Red. The corridor was deserted, save for the nurses moving around at their station. Seth and his dad ran to the nurses, asking where he had gone. They were met with questioning stares. No doctor or member of hospital staff had passed this way in the last 15 minutes. The doctor that had just spoken with them caught up. Would you like to see your wife's body, Mr Rogers? Yes, I would. She can't be dead, not after what we've done. The group made their way to a lift and travelled down two floors to the mortuary, where a man with glasses greeted them. He led them into a room where there was a table covered by a sheet. There was clearly a body beneath the sheet. Do you want your son here? asked the man. Seth's dad looked down at him as if seeing him for the first time. It's fine, we're fine. He clutched his son tighter to him. The man with the glasses drew back the sheet revealing the face of Seth's mum, old before her time. The pair sank to their knees, sobbing. What did we do, Seth? What did we do? The doctors watched on impassively as the pair sobbed uncontrollably. <laughs>